China, the world's fastest growing industrial powerhouse. But the vast amount of energy needed to drive this economy comes at a price. China has suffered some of the worst environmental disasters in the world, due in part to the overexploitation of its natural resources. After the US, China is now the world's second largest importer and consumer of oil, importing over 100 million tons of crude oil in 2003, a 20% increase on the year before. As demand for energy grows, the government is investing in large-scale energy projects like the Three Gorges Dam. This kind of project may be a short-term solution for delivering energy to people in cities, but there are over 600 million people living in rural areas who all need energy to survive. In this episode, Earth Report travels to the remote Yunnan province, where efforts are underway to provide people with alternative, low-impact forms of energy. The mountains of northwest Yunnan. The sound of wood chopping is not from loggers with heavy equipment. Local people are collecting firewood. In this remote area of China, it's the only source of energy for cooking and heating. Her Mao Jin doesn't take much today. She only needs some extra logs to prepare the family's lunch and boil fodder for her pigs. But it takes her a long time. The hills around her village are barren these days, and she has to walk hours to reach this site, the only place where she can still find wood. In living memory, these mountains here were covered with forest, but commercial logging in the last few decades have stripped the mountains of their tree cover, and it's been disastrous for the environment. Soil erosion along the sides of the river valleys disturbs the balance of the watershed. The water supply for 500 million people is at risk, as four of Asia's main rivers have their upper reaches here in China's Yunnan province. The Irrawaddy and Salween flow to the Indian Ocean, the Mekong, freshwater source for all of Southeast Asia, and the Yangtze River, irrigating China for over 6,000 kilometers. And vanishing with the trees is the great range of wild plant and animal species. And that's the main reason for heavy floods that frequently kill people and destroy villages and farmland further downstream. Uh, after the heavy floods in 1998, the government banned commercial logging, so today this major problem has been solved. But local people are still collecting wood for fuel, and this is destroying the remaining forests. In fact, the collection of wood for fuel is now the major threat to the ecological system. Every family here uses up to 10 cubic meters of wood every year, and each year, 130,000 hectares are lost in this way. At this rate, in 50 years, little of the natural forest will be left. Her Maojin is aware of this problem, but so far, there's been no alternative to using wood. She lives with her family in Heichi, a typical village of the Nachi minority, where life has always been hard. Commercial logging made it even harder, destroying the natural resources the people here rely on. The villagers see little of the wealth the timber industry brought to the region. Her Mao Jin and her husband, the village chief of Hachi, have seen firsthand the damage done to their land. Twenty years ago, there was 70% more forest around the village, wood enough for our daily needs. And there were pheasants and hare, and we would go hunting in the forest on the hills. But now the forest is destroyed, and there are hardly village. The old town is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is a major tourist attraction. Here on the outskirts, a small enterprise is working on an innovation that will help the villagers in Hachi meet their energy needs. Engineer Her is putting the finishing touches on a very special stove. 
This simple gadget consumes 60 to 80% less wood than a traditional stove or fireplace. Support comes from outside, from the American TNC or the Nature Conservancy that specializes in working with local authorities and the United Nations Environment Programme. It's part of a worldwide initiative to develop alternative energy solutions. TNC also helps the villagers install it. They hope to cut consumption of wood by 75% in the region over the next 10 years. Overcollection of fuel wood has resulted in large ecological problems. The Nature Conservancy is tackling these problems together with local partners. Our goal is to remove the pressure of fuel wood collection from the ecological system to protect the unique environment, conserve the biodiversity, but also to improve local people's lives. Today, Engineer Her brings the stove to Hachi village and explains how to use it. The wood has to be chopped smaller than usual, and lighting the stove seems a little more tricky than it was for the old fireplace. Her Mao Jin finds it difficult at first, but thinks she'll get used to it. After all, she says, it helps us save wood, and that's really great. After some adjustments, the stove works fine. Best of all, it burns with much less smoke than the old fireplace, so it's also much better for their health. Finally, the family can enjoy the first meal cooked on the new stove. It's delicious, and of course, Engineer Her is invited to join the feast. He's proud and happy to see them using his stove today. It took him a long time to develop a device that works well and the villagers accept. They rejected earlier models because people here are used to cooking on open fires and wanted a visible flame. It's market day in Shigu, a Nachi village at the first bend of the Yangtze River. Farmers from nearby townships of Lijiang County come to sell their goods and buy their daily needs. This is the right place for Engineer Her to find new customers for his stove. The demonstration attracts a lot of attention. The villagers are stunned to see how fast the water boils and how little wood is used. The simple but efficient technology is a winner, and the stoves are selling well throughout northwest Yunnan. Meanwhile, in Hachi village, life goes on. Her Mao Jin gets up very early in the morning every day of the week. Field work, housework, and looking after the animals, her daily chores don't give her much time to rest. But her life has become a little easier, as wood collecting doesn't consume so much time anymore. The new stove works well now. But that's not all. Earlier this year, the family installed a biogas plant. Biogas turns waste not into gold, but into something even more precious, cheap and clean energy. The four-in-one system introduced by the Nature Conservancy does much more than just provide energy for cooking and lighting. It's combined with a greenhouse, a pig pen, and a toilet. The heart of the unit is this six cubic meter underground concrete tank, the biogas digester. It ferments animal and human waste producing energy in the form of gas. With the help of neighbors, a unit like this can be built in less than a week. They cost 1,500 RMB, about 180 US dollars, not counting the cost of labor. The greenhouse above the biogas digester keeps the heat, which accelerates the process of fermentation. 
This is critical during colder months. It also provides excellent conditions for growing vegetables and raising pigs. The pig and human waste feeds the biogas digester and instead of polluting the water and soil, becomes energy. The fermentation process also produces this residue, which is an excellent organic fertilizer for the vegetables in the greenhouse. So the whole system is perfect for organic farming and it supplies free and renewable energy. The biogas is really convenient, Her Maojin says. I only need to press a button and the fire lights. But our plant doesn't provide enough gas for cooking three meals a day, so we still need some wood. But it's a lot less now. And I have more time to work in the greenhouse and raise pigs. I sell some of the vegetables and almost all the pigs at the market. With that extra money, we can now afford to send our two youngest children to high school. These are 90 yuan, about $10 every week. That's quite a lot, but my biggest dream is for them to have a better life, so they can make their own choices one day. At the Hachi Primary School, the children learn to make the right choices for the environment. Environmental education is compulsory and is taught twice a week. The kids learn about their responsibility for their own future and what they can do to protect nature. And the school practices what it teaches. It was the first site to use the new wood-burning stove and the first place in the village to install a greenhouse and biogas unit. The students help maintain it. They collect the animal waste from the households which don't have their own biogas plant. Working in the greenhouse, they learn about the benefits of organic farming and grow vegetables for school lunch. Before, fresh greens were a rare item on the school menu. When we start a project, we select a school as the first demonstration site to show the people that the technology works, the villagers' income is low, and they don't want to invest much money in a new thing unless they know it's working. Students and teachers are better educated and accept changes more easily. Students will go home, tell their parents about the new technologies, and they come and have a look. This is a great way to introduce these new ideas. And of course, it helps when the village chief decides first to try out the new devices. Since Her Ru Jin installed his, 71 of 122 households in Hachi have installed biogas digesters and many have new stoves. And the project is expanding and spreading to other areas. kilometers by air or two days drive north of Lijung, the Mekong River meanders between the foothills of the eastern Himalayas. Dechin County is home to the highest peak in Yunnan, the 6,740 meter Meli Chushan or Mount Kawagebo. This mountain is sacred to Tibetans and it's an important place for Buddhist pilgrims. But nobody has ever climbed to the peak. The valleys and mountain slopes a home to 200 different species of rhododendron, a wealth of other flowers, over 2,000 plants with medicinal properties, and rare animals like this snub-nosed monkey. Northwest Yunnan is a treasure house of biodiversity. But the ecosystem here is under pressure from population growth and unsustainable development. Northwest Yunnan's once rich biodiversity is disappearing at a frightening rate, and the loss of natural forests is the main reason. Durchin, the county capital. The majority of the population is Tibetan, 80%. Durchin is one of the poorest areas in China. Before the ban in 1998, 80% of the county's revenue came from commercial logging. Today, the government promotes reforestation of the mountain slopes and farmland. But for the poor, 
it seems like a huge economic sacrifice. In the villages along the Mekong Valley, the task of environmental protection has fallen to the locals. It's difficult. Traditionally, wood is the most important source of energy and material for construction. Today, years after commercial logging's been stopped, an average household here still cuts up to 30 cubic meters of fuel wood every year. In the past, there was much more forest around the village. But then they built the road, and with that, money came to the village, and every family could build a big house. But a lot of trees have been cut these days. In 1984, the construction of a road brought the logging companies to the villages. That meant also modest prosperity for the villagers, and like many others, Tang Shuang Lu and his family built a house in the typical Tibetan style. A big house with room for the animals in the basement and storage for crops upstairs. But today, the Tangs see just how many problems the destruction of the forest has caused, not only for their own village. I know that the deforestation here in our area severely damaged the rivers, especially the Mekong and the Yangtze. And that caused huge inundations and floods that destroyed the fields and the villages further downstream. I've seen that on television. So the forest is very important. We must not destroy it, we must protect it. And for the last few years, I've been thinking a lot about how I can help protect the forest. And that's the reason why the Tang family had no hesitation in joining the TNC-backed local government's bid to develop alternative energy sources. Today, a solar water heater is installed on their roof in a matter of minutes. It'll provide hot water all year round and is basically maintenance-free. Just a few hours, even on a cloudy day, and the first hot water runs from the tap. But this luxury is not a gift. It costs three to four thousand RMB, or four to five hundred dollars for such a system, and at least half of it has to be paid by the household. TNC and the Chinese government put in some money, but every household also has to help pay for it. The villagers here are relatively poor, but we still insist they put in some money. This gives them a feeling of ownership and a sense of responsibility for the new technology. They look after it carefully and make sure it's used properly. In Jidong village, the alternative energy project has been an astonishing success. About 50 of the 64 households now have a solar water heater and almost all of them have installed a biogas unit. The Tangs got theirs last year. It took a while to convince the villagers to put their money into this new technology, but once they saw how well it worked at the local school and saw government offices using the new technology, the people were quick to follow. Recently, the government put a small hydropower plant on a tributary of the Mekong River that now brings electricity for basic needs to the villages. But firewood has not yet been completely replaced. Even with the hydroelectricity, biogas and solar heater, the villagers still need some firewood. There's also a learning process as they get used to the new way of doing things. Today, Amuga is boiling pig fat. It takes an hour doing it the old way and she feels more comfortable using her old stove this time. Her son, Tung Shu Yun is in charge of cutting wood on the mountains. The old oak and pine trees have gone, but the young pines are already sprouting. These trees are the beginnings of a new forest, so long as the people are willing to let it grow. Already now, the Tangs use only half the wood they used to, and with the new water heater, it'll be even less and that's not only good for the forest. It also tackles 
what the World Health Organization calls one of the most serious risks to human health worldwide. Indoor air pollution from burning biomass like wood or leaves can cause chronic respiratory diseases like bronchitis and asthma. It can lead to pneumonia, tuberculosis and even lung cancer. Women and children are especially exposed because they work around the fireplace long hours. Alternative energies help reduce indoor air pollution and the health risks connected. Amugar says life is much better than it used to be. When I was a child, she says, we would only have such delicious things once a year at Spring Festival. Now we can have them every day. And we worked so much harder. Today there is gas lighting and the biogas stove, electricity to make flour and to use a rice cooker, and now we even have hot water from the tap. Years of commercial exploitation have taken away from the people in China's rural areas their natural resources. Alternative energies are a chance to save the remaining forests and improve people's lives. And by reducing the consumption of fuel wood, the foliage will grow back, soil erosion will be less, and balance will be restored to the watershed. It's now time to take the initiative. But the local people shouldn't have to do it alone. They're not just protecting the forests, rivers, and the watershed for themselves. They're also doing it for those who live downstream in other richer parts of Asia. The people of northwest Yunnan have accepted the responsibility, but they need help if they're to protect this biological treasure house for their benefit and for the benefit of the millions who live downstream.